Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Sugar Mama's Fireplay podcast. Now, today you're in luck because I am publishing a bonus episode this week. I had an old podcast which I took down a long time ago, and it was the interview with my own personal mortgage broker asking him all about how to apply to for a home loan, when's the right time, talking about buy now, pay later, the impact of hex debt, credit cards, uh, whether we should be fixing and how is the best way about going that and so many great bits of information. Anyway, that podcast was taken down and I was inundated with so many DMs and emails from you guys saying, can you please, please, please put that back up? It was filled with so much great high value content. So I am publishing or republishing this podcast so that you can listen to all of Adam's words of wisdom. Now, as mentioned, Adam is my own personal mortgage broker. Uh, His name is Adam McCabe from Blue Lantern. And whilst I reaffirm this during the podcast, I do not receive any commission or referrals whatsoever if you go and contact Adam and ask him for help. I'm just simply sharing this podcast and interviewing Adam because he's extremely knowledgeable. I trust him. He's transparent and he has so much wisdom and experience to impart on with everyone who listens to this podcast. Now, on another note, I promise to publish a fresh episode with Adam talking about today's economic environment, the interest rate environment, whether we should still be looking at fixing our home loans or not, or run the gauntlet and see what the RBA does now that we're in a completely different interest rate environment. Anyway, enough here from me. Please enjoy listening to all of Adam's words of wisdom and know that whilst it is an older podcast from about two years ago, the advice, as in the general advice, and the insight, knowledge and information here is extremely valuable. So please enjoy and feel free to contact Adam. Everyone, welcome back to Sugar Mama's Fire Play podcast. I am financial planner, Canna Campbell. Today we have someone very important coming on as a guest speaker. My very own mortgage broker. I'm going to claim you, Adam, sorry, as mine. I have known Adam for, I think we used to work together when we were, I was in my early 20s, I think. How old were you? It'd be 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. At, at least. We're yeah. really old now. And Adam is one of the few people that I trust with mortgages, a giving good advice, honest advice, independent advice, not there to sell a product, and also to give a guiding light as to when people are sailing too close to the wind, you know, look for things are looking too tight, or that you think they're making, you know, a bad decision, you're, you're, you'll give your honest feedback. And that's why I've always valued you. And, and you do my own finances, you do my own investment loans, and you also do my clients' mortgages and investment loans. So you're someone that I really trust. And as I said, you're one of two people really that I trust when it comes to, to mortgages. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to point out that this podcast is not sponsored <laughs> by Adam, but for anyone who's listening to this and thinks, you know what, I we need an Adam in our life to have a look at our mortgages, I will obviously link Adam's contact details below. And no, I do not get any sort of referral fees or commission for this. This is I just know Adam's a good person and, and I trust him and, I, and I'm happy to share the love. So for today's podcast, I want to I'm going to pick Adam's brain on behalf of all the listeners and ask him his thoughts on mortgages, fixed rates, um, what to look out for, when to contact a mortgage broker, who to approach, what questions to ask, all those sort of nitty gritty questions that you might be wondering and thinking about, but maybe you're too scared to ask a mortgage broker or you're just just not ready yet. So can you just tell me a little bit about yourself, your business, and what you do for people? Yes, so thanks, Kenna. Look, I've been a mortgage broker now for 18 years. My business is Blue Lantern Financial Services. And um, look, I was really passionate about this industry from leaving school. Got involved in the industry and it really just took me from that point. Started off in the, the early stages were, um, yeah, the, the nuts and bolts of the process from home loan settlements all the way through to assisting clients face-to-face, giving yeah. advice and really helping people achieve their dreams of buying that perfect house or you know providing a more efficient mortgage structure for them to help pay their debts down so that's it in a nutshell for me yeah <laughs> i have to say i think you're really 
undervalued in the marketplace because you help people achieve their dreams and, and financial goals. You know, Absolutely. they're buying their first home or upgrading to the bigger family home because they have, you know, they're moving on with different natural yeah. life cycles or saving, you know, tens of thousands of dollars off, you know, their, you know, their mortgage through interest rates and, and shopping around and getting people a better deal. Like you add a lot of value to people's lives and, and it's, it's quite often a thankless job. Absolutely, can I? And look, more recently with all of the raft of changes in yeah, the regulation, the legislation, um, and the compliance yes, and absolutely. the legal costs. Yeah, I hear your pain. I feel your pain. Yeah, it's I'm a, going um, it too. It's it can be an arduous pro- process mm. at times, yeah. and and an invasive one also mm, yeah. with the new regulation around re- verifying customer expenditure and looking through bank statements and credit card statements yeah. and. That's all part of the process now that we try and help with. Yeah. Look, it, it is, uh, you know, because of the Royal Commission, which it, to a certain degree is a good thing that they're making it so much more stringent, you know, for people to borrow money. It comes with a lot of extra hard work, a lot of time, a lot of compliance, a lot of risk is then, you know, worn on your shoulders um, to, to help people. So... If anyone does use Adam, please make sure you give him a massive thank you because I'm confident he'll be able to to help you. Now, I want I've got a list of eleven questions, and I know that you're you know a little bit nervous about doing this podcast. I've been begging you for a long time, so I am very grateful for you doing this. Um, I the first question on my list is when should someone approach a mortgage broker? Is that when they suddenly decide they want to buy their first home, or is it when they've got their twenty percent deposit, or their say half of their deposit? or when they've got their 20% deposit plus the stamp duty, like at what stage would someone pick up the phone and say, I need to speak with you or meet with you? Yeah, look, that's probably a two-part question, I would, I would say. Firstly, if, if you're a home buyer, the ideal time is as, as soon as you feel that you've got your deposit ready and mm-hmm. you're starting to look, mm. definitely get in touch before you're looking at properties because otherwise the emotions can get involved and you're looking at property that you may not be able to afford, yeah. Um, or you know the loan size may not be suitable that you need for that. So, but probably around four to six weeks at least before you're you're ready to look. The process can be a little time consuming initially to get a full understanding of your current situation. Yeah, there's lots of paperwork and there statements and, and and it's preparation yeah. of the application, mm, which mm. can also take in the current environment, you know, a couple of weeks to be reviewed as well. So. Particularly when there's lots of applications going at the one time and the banks are kind of behind. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There can be some lags. Some lenders, you know, up to four to six weeks. Some are fast. And that's a part of what we do as well. If Mm. it's important and um, critical that you get a fast approval so that you don't miss a property, that's part of what we do as well. Make sure we're looking at a lender that can provide a quick, quick response for you. And I know personally how important that is because Adam helped us buy our home that we're living in right now at Monday Beach. It was... Literally, we, you know, we, I wouldn't say we, I didn't, Tom fell in love with the house. He was like a neurotic pregnant nutcase. Like he just had to have this house. And we knew that we were, you know, potentially about to walk, go into a bidding war with three other buyers. Um, so we needed to be, we needed to give them a strong offer and a good offer so that we secured the property. And I, I remember meeting with you, you know, at the old house late at night to like get all this done and yeah, yeah it, that is having someone who's reliable <clears throat> and and you can trust that's going to help you get this over the line particularly in a property market like this is really valuable absolutely and look it's it's also the best part with the brokers in this part of the process for pre-approval to buy is that you're getting unbiased advice mm. um, if you go to one to one lender you're only you'll only get what their solution is what their products are and what their borrowing capacity might be for you well this is my next question for you and it's funny i was talking to a client the other day and he, he banks with a fairly big bank and he's like oh i'll just go to my where I bank to, to review my home loan i'm like no don't do that like why would someone be why would that potentially be a foolish idea to say well i bank with xyz bank i'll just pop into the branch when i'm walking past and see what better rates i can get What's wrong with that? Look, this is my opinion that, that, that if you go direct to your existing bank that you've got your savings or credit card with, that your business isn't necessarily valued as highly as you are to a new bank. Mm. Um, it is a very competitive market at the moment um, yeah. and brokers are driving that. Yeah, That's the reason why there's so much downward pressure on more discounts in mm. the interest rate market. So. Look, by going to a broker, you open up a whole range of options. You're talking 50, 60 lenders. Going direct wow. to your bank, yeah, look, you, 
you'll get what they what they offer you. You won't necessarily get their sharpest rate if they think they've already got you. That's the way I see it. That's my opinion. But I, but I think most definitely, if you're going to a broker, you will find. 99 times over 100, you're getting the best deal out there for you. Yeah. yeah. And that's really important because so often you can look at the interest rate and go, well, it's okay. They offered me a rate. It, it's okay. It's, it's you know, say 3.1%. And you think it's no really big deal because I can get it for the... I can get it for the bank across the road for, say, 2.9%. But really, that interest rate savings is minimal. But that's not the case at all. That, that you know, basis point difference could save you not just thousands of dollars in interest, tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, particularly over a 30-year loan. So it's, you don't get, you, you're being very foolish if you're being lazy by just saying, I can't be bothered, it's too much paperwork, it's too hard. Like, that's where you come in, that's where the value Absolutely. you add, and that's why you, you get yeah. paid commission on the loan. Like, and you are fully entitled to it because you work so hard for it. And there, I'm sure there are lots of applications where you do all this hard work and, ne- and then they, you know, it never actually comes to fruition or they decide not to buy anymore and you've sunk hours and hours and hours and days and weeks of work into that application. That's exactly right. And you, you're spot on. Um, convenience by staying with a lender for, for a higher rate um, or what you think is a, only a slightly higher rate mm. over 30 years, convenience can become very costly. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the best solution with going to a, a broker is not only... The rate, but also the product and the suitability of the product and what suits your day-to-day mm. living, the way that you operate your budget. Do you use a credit card? You know, do you park money in an offset account? All of those types of questions that we help help uh, answer for you as well. So it's almost like you kind of almost create a bespoke mortgage for your clients. In in a way, it's definitely bespoke in a way, but it's also education. What I like to mm. think of education yeah. on, on how to operate them. They are quite. Um, quite simple products mm. in many ways, but if you aren't really skilled or un- don't understand the, f- the full best use of those products, mm. um, you won't get the best out of them. Exactly, 100%. Mm. It's the same with any sort of financial product that you're using. If you don't know how to use it wisely, it's, it, you're not going to use it for its, van- it for its advantage right. and you're not going to even be grateful for the benefits of that financial tool. That's right. And it's funny, you know, you look at people who do all these weird and wonderful ways to save money, and I'm all for saving money, but quite often the easiest, and I say this because so many people can be lazy and complacent with staying with their existing home loan provider, is, you know, you will do all these things like take your lunch to work, you know, make your own coffee at home, which are great things, and I I do a lot of those things myself, especially for the $1,000 project, but quite often the easiest and biggest and simplest saving is right under our nose. It's refinancing the home loan to a, a low interest rate, and it's it's very easily tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in interest. Absolutely, and streamlining uh, streamlining your accounts, um, not having multiple credit cards and everyday transaction mm. accounts, a lot of those attract fees, and they're unnecessary. Sometimes you don't realise it, yeah. um, but every year the fees are coming off those they, credit cards. They add up. Yeah. Okay, all right, if I was looking for a mortgage, uh, what are the key things... As a new buyer or first home buyer, what would I be looking for in my in my first mortgage? Uh, the the biggest uh, the biggest point there would be suitability, and when I say suitability, I mean the t- the type of mortgage. So it could be a combination of fixed and variable mm-hmm. because you want some certainty yep. um, around that repayment if it's your first mortgage. Mm-hmm. Fixed rates give you that. Mm. Um, so it's a locked in interest rate. You've got certainty of knowing what that payment is. Um, over that fixed period, whether it's one, two, three to five years. Um, also, um, variable rate can give you flexibility to pay off extra or offset the, that mortgage mm. with your salary and your savings. But, and on offset, I probably prefer a redraw facility to an offset account just because of the psychology of money, yeah. even though they mathematically work the same way. Out of sight, out of mind. I, exactly. Yeah. Kind of, I find an offset account acts as a bit of a smoke and mirrors because people can get fixated on seeing you know, $50,000 in their in their offset account but, and they kind of focus on how amazing that is and kind of take their foot off the gas for their budget. When really the reality is you've still got a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage you've got to knock off. Whereas, you know, if you put that fifty thousand into the, the home loan and went, Okay, well we've got a four hundred thousand or four hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage to focus on, you're just kind of taking away any distractions that make give might give you maybe a false sense of security. But correct. But redraws and offset accounts, they're very valuable in helping you save money. And I I every now and again I come across someone who tells me they've got their emergency money of thirty thousand dollars sitting in an online savings account floating around in cyberspace. I'm like half a percent. <laughs> why is that yeah. not against your home loan that's charging you like 
two two and a half three percent on your home loan, you're earning at the half a percent. Like that's crazy. And when I run the numbers, and there and you is pay tax on that as well. Pay tax on it. It's just and, and then add inflation. You're going mm-hmm. backwards. There, with so much it used to upset me so much that I actually built a, ca- a calculator on the Sugar Mama website called the Mortgage Offset Calculator, and you can run your own numbers to see the efficiency of when you use your redraw facility or offset account to hold your emergency yeah. money. All right, if I was buying, even not necessarily a first home owner uh, or buyer, if I have a, a mortgage and I'm looking, all right, I'm right, okay, I have a feeling I can get a better deal. What should I be telling you? Should I be telling you, look, I really want to pay off my mortgage or do you not really care? Like, do I need to tell you my financial goals? Do I need to tell you that I'd actually like to look at debt recycling in a couple of years or I really hate having a mortgage, I want to pay it off as quickly as possible or actually I'm thinking of moving out of this house and turning it into an investment property. Should I be telling you all of this stuff? Is that important? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's first and foremost what we we talk about with the clients that I meet. We want to know what your goals um, and objectives are with the loan that we're looking at for you. So if your priority is to pay debt down as quickly as possible, Mm. Then we can look at what your budget's like, what your cash flow surplus is. Mm. Can we look at a reduced loan term as well as going to a lower interest rate? I mean, ideally, that's what we like to be doing each time we refinance in any mortgages. Mm. It's really important to do that instead of going off the general 25 or 30 year loan terms. Yeah. Um, yeah. We find it's common that people refinancing are looking constantly going back to the 25 or 30 year term. Mm. So it's not just about getting a better rate, um, it's about reducing that term. So we want to know everything about what your plans are, yeah. what's important to you. Is it, do you need, can you have a really simple loan structure where you don't, as you said, just a redraw account? Yeah, you, you pay for all the bills and whistles. You don't that need get to pay for in. the annual yeah. fees for the offset and things like that. There are options as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look, we want to know everything and we do need to know. You know, it's part of our, it's part of our role and the more we know, the better advice we can give. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. Like I always, whenever you've, You've refinanced my home loan, you know, a couple of times, you know, you know, to get better rates and better yeah. deals, and I've always been so transparent with you of what the per- you know my goal is behind it, which has always been pay off my home loan mm. as quickly as possible. But you know, for all the listeners and people who are watching on on the YouTube channel, you know, don't hold back. Make the more you communicate to your mortgage broker and to to your financial planner as well, yeah. the better the advice is going to be. The more tailored, the more custom, the more bespoke your strategy and financial products and tools are going to help you in achieving your financial goals and dreams. All right. Is a lower interest rate always best? Because, you know, you could be sitting in the car and you see a bus drive past saying, you know, this new interest rate of 2.79%. Is that always the best thing? Like, do we just chase the lowest return or is it a lot more complicated than that? Look, most definitely not. If you're doing that, you'll be seeing a new rate floating around every month. Go round, you can round around. Yeah, absolutely, circles. and every time you're moving, there's fees associated with moving as well. Some yeah. of them hidden that yeah. you don't realise until it's all gone through. Ooh. So obviously, the lowest rate is is the goal. Ideally, um, yeah, mm. for thirty years, but not necessarily something you should be chasing so regularly. Mm. Communicate with your broker. There's other options you can look at, particularly in your current environment. Mm. So we normally. Normal advice for us is a variable rate over the term of your loan, you'll always be better off. Yeah. However, there are periods in time, such as our current climate, mm. where fixed rates can be advantageous and you can take advantage of that, yeah. which gets you back up to par with what's more of a market rate. Mm. Um, but most definitely, chasing the, the lowest variable rate that you're seeing out there advertised yeah. will get you in a whole lot of trouble because you're constantly mm. moving, constantly paying fees to move, and depending on who you meet and see, as I said earlier, you may end up back on a 25, 30 year loan term when mm. you were scheduled to pay it off in 20 years with your previous loan. Which is so important. This is what mm. I say to people. Whenever you go and refinance, try as much as you possibly can to avoid restarting that loan term because you're just pushing yes. that problem into the future, giving a, you know, a false sense of security with the new reduced cash flow. Try, if you are, say, 10 years into your 30 year term and you're going to refinance, say to your mortgage broker, I'm you know 10 years in, I don't want to restart my loan time because I still make sure I pay off with the new mortgage. Mm. My home is paid off in 20 years or even with less with the interest rate discount that you're getting. We like like to really look at what you are paying at the moment Mm. and whatever new loan we're looking at, keeping the payment the same or more so that you are really accelerating that debt reduction. And it works. It it does. You run the numbers on the Sugar Mama Mm. website for the mortgage calculators and you've got mortgage calculators um, as well. You can really see the effect of like $200 a month, what that does extra in your mortgage repayment to your home loan. 
the how many years it shaves off, Correct. how much you know, tens of thousands of dollars of interest it saves. All right, next question is probably more relevant to the economic conditions that we're in right now. Are you going with fixed or variable home loans? Like, what are you? I know it's general advice, but what are you recommending? Um, look, at the moment, it depends again on individual circumstances. Mm. For example, someone with a lot of cash in offset would we wouldn't be looking at a fixed rate yeah. because you know that you you stop away from them. No, that, that's right. And you don't generally can't fix uh, mm. offset and a fixed rate. Mm. So it's individually tailored. But look, we are doing a bit more fixing than I've ever done before in my my time um just because you know what we saw was interest rates um and a government fund that was provided when COVID hit for banks to access cheaper funds mm. so we're seeing some lower fixed rates yeah than, than variable so it's a good time to take advantage of those not on too long a term mm. um you know two to three years max is what we're sort of looking at at the moment that yeah. could change sooner though Especially with the Australian dollar being so strong, you know, there's a risk that interest rates, even though the RBA is saying that they intend mm. for interest rates to stay low for quite some time, that doesn't guarantee that they're going to stay. And, and the no, Australian dollar, right. you know, becoming increasingly um, stronger, that is a that is a real risk that interest rates may start going up sooner than what we would ideally hope for. That's that's right. And, mm. But again, it comes down to making sure that the, the loan that you're ending up with and, and, and interest, well, sorry, loan um, assessment rates are still around the five to six percent. Mm. So what that means is, when a lender calculates your calculates your maximum loan term, uh, mm. your maximum loan borrowing capacity, yeah, it's still based around that five to six mark mm. percentage mark. So it's, okay. it, there's sensitivity there. So, but I, I mean, fixing um, on the shorter term is is okay as long as you've got some flexibility there if you need it. And don't fix yeah. the whole entire loan. That's right. Fix half of it, fix a third of it, fix two thirds of it. Allow yourself some breathing space so if you have a financial windfall, you can throw it onto the variable amount and not be penalised or not be. I mean, I, I had a situation with someone I know who went and fixed their entire loan, which was completely against my advice. They ended up getting a massive bonus at work and they had to put all that money into a separate savings account. They couldn't put it anywhere. Yeah. And they would have saved. Probably a good like eighty, ninety thousand dollars interest if they've been able to throw it onto their home loan. So please don't go and fix your entire loan. Give yourself some flexibility and Or as you mm. said earlier, give us all of your information. If you are yeah. expecting an inheritance mm. or a big financial windfall, you, need to, you need to know about it. That's all right. Yeah. And and look, you know, people get promotions, they get um, you know, pay rises, you know, they might have a great investment that did very well. Like it, it is, you know, it's, <coughs> oh no, nothing's going to happen to me. I've got no money coming away. Actually, you never know what might, might be coming away. That's right. Um, and then on that note, I need to actually talk to you about fixing some of my investment loans. I don't want to fix a home loan, um, but I do want to talk to you about fixing some of my investment loans just to have that security and peace of mind. And uh, of which my, I will point out my investment loans are all on P and I, not interest only. Very good. All right, next, these are questions that I'm really excited about asking you because um, I'm going to prove a lot of financial experts and illiterate financial influencers wrong. All right, does HEX help student debt impact your ability to borrow money? Yes, it does. Thank you. I am so sick to death, I'm going to get really angry now, of certain financial experts, and there's a lot, in, lot of them who on surface level tell you, don't worry about your student debt. It's interest-free, you don't need to worry about it, it's the cheapest, best loan you'll ever get, just let it sit there. So you have it from a very 18 years experienced mortgage broker who's been doing, you've been doing this for such a long time and you've seen, I know you've personally, you've gone through so many different tough experiences yeah. in your job as in like getting really tough loans through. It does impact your ability to borrow money. It does. From, from the standpoint that um, it comes out of your, your gross pay. Yeah. So, so your, your, your repayments, interest free, whatever that is irrelevant. Well, it's, it, it's indexed. It's not really interest free. It's, that's I wish the government wouldn't say yeah. it's interest free. It's so fraudulent. So, and, and at the end of the day, it does come off what you would, you know, if you had no hex debt, mm. you more cash in the hand at the end of your pay. Yeah. So therefore you'd be able to, you have more borrowing power, which True. means, and I, um, I've done a, pod, a video about this the other day, but I was talking to this really lovely girl. She had $80,000 in student debt. And she was saving up for her first home and she had no idea that number one, that $80,000 indexed and with an index inflation rate of say 3%, it was going $2,400 a year. She was going deeper and deeper into debt. And she was there, her and her husband were saving for their first mm -hmm. home. 
He also had student debt, also with the same surface level, you know, advice of don't worry about your student loans, you know, it's interest free. And she was horrified when I was like, no, no, you got maybe you might not be able to necessarily buy or borrow as much as you think you can because between the two of you, you have over a hundred thousand dollars in student debt. Like, it's it's people just oh, it's so frustrating. And I would want to know, of course, like this doesn't get rid of the problem, but at least if you know that in advance, you can start putting maybe a more accelerated debt reduction strategy in place before you go and apply for a home loan. Yeah. Look, yeah. it's it's also obviously if you if you've got a university degree and you've got the next debt, you'd more than likely be on the hot higher than the yeah you, the, the standard wages the normal mm. wages, but um it can impact the amount that you can borrow, and that's just an individual test of what you know what that is. I think in a property market like this that's so strong, people are missing out on homes, you know, and you'd be you'd be kicking yourself going, you know, we approved the bank said that we could borrow five hundred thousand, and the property sold for twenty thousand dollars more than than um, we could afford. If we didn't have that student debt, we would have been able to stretch yourself for that extra 20000 And I say stretch yourself with caution because I never recommend someone should stretch themselves financially when it comes no. to borrowing money ever. But th- that, could, that very shallow surface level bit of advice can come with huge regret and um, huge frustration that you didn't know that up front. So now people know, take your student debt seriously, it does impact your ability to borrow. All right, next question I want to ask is the buy now, pay later um, services that are available, which I'm not ag- I'm not against at all. I'm just, I recommend people use them responsibly and wisely. And there are a whole, you know, sea of people out there who I know from personal t- stories that they've shared with me and even myself, I occasionally use it. Um, so we're talking about the buy now, pay later, the afterpays, the Klarna's, um, zip pays. Do they impact your ability to borrow money? Yes, they do. Okay, how? They're treated similarly to how credit card limits are treated. Mm, yeah. Um, so whatever your buy now, pay later mm. limit is, mm. um, is assessed at between, from lender to lender it varies, yeah. around 3 to 5% of the limit mm-hmm. is your monthly commitment, assumed commitment, as okay. a minimum payment to that loan. Okay, so my next question is, is I occasionally use Klarna, you know, um, but it, it's always paid off in full, um, normally before the six-week period. Assuming I'm paying it off and using it correctly, and say at the time I go to apply for my loan and I don't have any Klarna payments going on, and I will point point out that Klarna have a minimum one thousand, sorry, maximum one thousand dollar limit. Like if I'm not using it, does that that will then impact my ability to borrow money? No, look, it's, it's whether you're using it or not. It's the availability of yeah. the limit. So yeah. similar similar to a credit card. Yeah. So it'd be equivalent of having a, th- a credit card with a thousand dollar limit. Correct. So, and, and a ten, for example, a ten thousand dollar credit card mm. um, comes with a monthly commit, assumed commitment mm. of you know, say four, three to five hundred dollars per month. Mm. That's the equivalent of, of probably seventy thousand dollars of a loan borrowing ca- capacity. So wow. if you're missing out on buying that ideal home, the dream home, mm. by fifty thousand, mm. you know, your credit card could have. Could have got you over the line if you cut it up. <laughs> yeah, isn't that interesting? You know, yeah. you know, um, the buy now pay later space gets smashed for you know saying it will you know it impact your ability to borrow money and drive, mm. borrow you know to buy your dream home. But in fact, it's the credit cards actually that are, are more dangerous to your ability to, to buy your dream home. Correct, and credit cards for some time now have been considered a bit of a status, a bit mm. of a society status. Yeah, so yeah. The gold, the platinum card. The, oh, the black Amex. Yeah, yeah. all of that type of stuff. So the titanium Amex or something someone told me about the other day. And, and we have a number of clients mm. that come to us with four or five credit cards, credit limits totaling $150,000, mm. but refuse to reduce the limits or close the cards because mm. it's an assumed status. Uh, what is wrong with people? That's, that stops you from buying, it, whether mm. it's, you know... Um, taking advantage of the equity and investing. Or yeah, yeah. Or cash flow that, tools. Yeah. Or something. Look, I'm not, I'm actually for credit cards. Like as long as, you, and I'm, I'm for, you know, the, the, you know, as I said, I use Klarna and I, I use it occasionally for special things, but you know, I, and I, I also have a credit card, but I have one credit card and I keep my limit um, as low as I'm actually, the lowest limit I'm allowed to with that one and only yeah. credit card. And I use it responsibly, but I think it's important that people need to get some get their facts right with this whole student debt, um, you know, buy now pay later um, uh, space and and see the actual truth because there's a lot of um, uh, misleading information that's, that, right. that's come yeah. out of there. Yeah. Then that's really interesting to see that 
um, you know, the credit card can potentially be more dangerous than the, the buy now, pay later. And well, the other, mm. the, another factor with the, the buy now, pay later, and we may go into this. I may, <laughs> this one's a bit of a um, jump, a rain on your parade there, but the um, the buy now, pay later can also um, give a reflection of how much you are spending on, um, you know, clothing or mm. or shopping items per month, yeah. which which is another mm. um, area that the banks really look into. And is invasive. Yeah, it is invasive. But that's part of responsible lending now. Exactly, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't have it. I mean, when you apply for a home loan, you've got to air your dirty laundry, that's right. um, and that's part of the responsibility mm. of you know taking on. If someone's going to lend you four or five hundred thousand dollars, you've got to do the right thing and be honest. So, okay, that's I'm right. so glad to have set the record straight. Okay. Um, now, okay, next questions are: um, if I'm self-employed, which I am. Um, is it going to be harder to borrow money? Am I going to have to maybe consider an extra couple of weeks in the loan application period because you're going to require letters from my accountant, P&Ls, balance sheets, um, you know, all the finer details of my financial affairs? Yes, um, self-employed borrowing is or can be harder depending mm. on your individual circumstances mm. and also how up-to-date your accountant is with your paperwork. Yeah. Generally speaking... The most majority of accounts will have um, the paperwork completed in time for mm. compliance reasons, but um, there are periods of time throughout the year when it when it becomes too old, or the previous tax returns are mm. acceptable to rely on. Uh, comes sort of February March this year, so we're talking the twenty twenty financial year yeah. that ended in June twenty twenty. Mm. We're now March twenty twenty one. We're getting we're getting to, towards a point where. Uh, sorry, 2019 I'm referring to, where the next year is, is required um, or looking at bad statements for the, the past mm. 12 months. Okay. Um, so it can be a bit more of a difficult process depending on what type of business mm. you have as well. Yeah. Um, in COVID, for example, w- whether it was a business business that was impacted by COVID. Um, yeah, of course. Retail yeah. Or, yeah. And this is where it's, you know, the benefit of a, of a independent, experienced, knowledgeable mortgage broker can come in because you know, all right, well, we know that this lender is, is particularly good in, in looking at the person's individual circumstances. And C- Correct. So some mm. lenders have different policy around self-employed borrowers mm, mm. Um, that could be more suitable for you. For example, some lenders will, will just look at one year worth of tax returns and financials. Yeah. The majority want the previous two years, but yeah. if you don't have two years worth, what are your options? Well, the mortgage brokers always know which way to look to open that space for you. Okay. Um, I know because Tom and I are both self-employed people. Like, I make videos for f- people to watch for free for a living. It's like, tr- and Tom pats ponies for a living. Like, try <laughs> telling a bank how we make yeah, monies. Yeah, um, the other question is, is, okay, if I'm thinking of changing jobs, but I'm also saving up for my first home, is that something I need to be aware of? Potentially. And it's something that I talk to a number of clients about. It's, it's a mm. good question because it's a phone call that I get often. Yeah. The, the only real issue there is if you're changing, for argument's sake, from being a builder, mm. a bricklayer, to a stockbroker. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. That rings. That, that that's signals red red flags. If it's if you're in the same line of work, going mm. to the similar pay or even higher pay, as mm. long as it's in line and yeah. not too significantly higher. Um, that's generally okay. What about probation periods, though? Probation periods can be um, accepted depending on the lender and, again, your circumstances. Mm. So much of what we talk about is, is your individual circumstances. Mm. For example, if you're looking to borrow, if you've only got you know a small deposit and you need to borrow 95% of the property value and mm. pay mortgage insurance, a lot of those type of um, you know probation isn't accepted. So that then comes down to the mortgage insurer, whether they'll um, yeah. approve that for your application, not so much the lender. Yeah. For the record, I hate mortgage insurance. I find it... Dead really... money. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Just... Yeah. Look, <laughs> um, sometimes it's an opportunity cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Pay. No, I agree with you on that. Yeah. But to just be constantly paying it because you're impatient or not saving enough, mm. you may end up regretting down the track. Yeah. And it's so expensive and you're paying for the bank's protection, on, yeah. like where they're charging you interest. I just... Generally only one winner there, can I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you... Think you're going to pay mortgage insurance? Just save a little harder, hustle a little harder. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's worth it. Though that savings is worth and, it. And, and just one last thing on that mortgage insurance: it can be a thousand dollars here or there that make a big difference. Really? So, for example, if you're looking at initially a ninety percent um, borrowing, so you've um, you're paying mortgage insurance up to ninety percent. If you're able to save a couple more thousand dollars to get mm. that below ninety percent. Mm 
that that premium can really change significantly when it gets below ninety versus being above. So there are That's so there interesting are tiers, to know. Yeah, there's certainly tiers to the um, the mortgage insurance premiums, and we can run through a lot of those numbers with and we do mm. with a lot of our clients and talk about the options that hey save five thousand on mortgage insurance here by mm. coming up with two thousand more cash. Which is mm. so easily done. Like if someone like said you're gonna save X yeah. you know, say ten thousand dollars in mortgage insurance if you have an extra three thousand dollars. Mm. I can suddenly like get really quite creative in coming up with a quick three thousand yeah. dollars. I mean that's what the thousand dollar project's all about. Yeah. But you you'll find a way. You, you you it will be worth it. Absolutely. All right, to wrap things up, um, what are your parting words of wisdom when it comes to borrowing money? Look, in today's bank or lending um, environment, it's mm. about being firstly being patient. Yeah. Um, be patient, be prepared because it can be an arduous process. Mm. Look, have a written budget. Be prepared with a written budget. Have all your ducks in, uh, lined up so your credit cards should be in order, your home gas and electricity bills should be yeah. paid on time these are all linked to your credit file um, your credit report is what banks look at firstly when they see an application from any any consumer they look at your credit file having all of your accounts in order mm. no late payments no overdrawn fees on on your savings account or your credit card is yeah. really important mm. as well that's actually yeah. a really interesting one because remember when we bought this place um tom had like a dollar 47 owing on an old credit card that he'd cancelled and it had he wasn't That's aware right. of it and there was something kept on coming up on our credit report we were like what the hell is it we don't we don't really use credit cards and we're really good responsible with money and it was one thing that was coming up and then he got to the bottom of it and it was like i owed a dollar 47 on an old credit card which i closed at ages ago but there was still about standing fee and he had like a 60 dollar late payment yeah. fee that and it was it was this teeny tiny irrelevant money but it, it impacted his his credit. Like. Yeah, look, questions are asked, but we're able to address it. So yeah. there's common sense like that, but it's a good point because what happens a lot with, and this happens to a lot of clients that I see with credit cards, there can be, you think you've paid it off, mm. but then there's some pro rata in, uh, interest for the previous yes, month. Yes, yeah, and yeah. it can be a dollar or that's, 20 I think it, well, that's what it was for Tom, and yeah, we so almost missed out on this house because of that. And that's that's right. why, you know, you were so fantastic in, in helping and, us. And it's about keeping an eye on those things. Being on top of it, so internet banking, have all of your statements registered for email uh, or online statements mm. instead of by mail. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, if the bank get the address wrong or it goes to a different um, a different house, mm. you know, that can cause you issues as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if I'm going to throw some of my advice in there just because I'm so passionate about, you know, being mindful of your money and responsible. And then I'm going to say is if you are going to borrow money, don't borrow, and I know Madam is going to agree with me, so don't go the necessarily the maximum that bank will lend you. That you know, if, you, if I go to the bank and they want to lend me a million dollars, that doesn't mean I should go and spend up to a million dollars and take that full million dollar loan. You know, Borrow what you feel comfortable with, that you can sleep well at night, run your numbers, run your budget. Yeah, you the, bu the budget's critical. It's, it's also about um, the maximum that you, that you can borrow. It's not so much that question... Most clients are, are flabbergasted at what their maximum capacity is when I mm. tell them. It's what you're comfortable paying each yeah. month. And that's what I try and bring it back to. It's more of a conversation about where's your comf comfortable position on the monthly repayments. Mm. Um, and then let's work it around that and then understand what your buying price is. That is why you are the, one of the few people I trust in recommending my clients to you because you, you, you're not trying to sell them you know, this massive loan or this massive product. You're selling them like quality. You're giving them the right type of product for their situation that's going to help them and never jeopardize their financial well-being. And the, this is um, and, and the other thing is, I, I know you said the banks run the serviceability on a five or six percent interest rate loan. Yeah. My advice to anyone who's looking at taking out a loan, and that is to have a look at the impact of a three percent interest rate rise on your home loan. Not a not three interest rate rises, but a three percent. So if you know that you can secure a, a home loan at three percent, run those those mortgage repayments, those monthly mortgage repayments or fortnightly mortgage repayments, with the interest rate now being six percent, and make sure that you can currently, under your current situation, your current cash flow, still afford to live in your home. Still, you can still pay that monthly mortgage repayment. You know, still maintain your lifestyle, still put food on the table, like. Don't just rely on the bank serviceability, run your own serviceability numbers. And you can jump on Adam's website, jump on my website, look at the numbers, but factor in a 3% interest rate rise, not three interest rate rises. That's, right. That's a big difference between the two. 
The other thing is, um, you know, pay above the prescription. Just because the bank put you on a 30-year term, don't just in the, your, your mortgage repayments to say $2,500 a month. Just go, okay, great, that's all I need to pay. No, if you can afford to, pay $3,000 a month or $3,200 or whatever you can afford. Try and pay your home loan off. And the the extra repayments and lump sum repayment calculators are on both Adam and my website will show you how much time and money you save. And Adam, quite often, what is... That's, yeah, look, it's it's um, it's something I encourage. Yeah, um, increasing your repayments or just setting up a, a manual. Um, have your minimum payment and then just go online and set up an automatic manual payment each month onto mm. the loan as well. Yeah, um, you yeah. won't miss that money as well. No. Once you start doing it, you're not going to miss it. And no. things like pay rises. If you get a pay rise, increase your you know your, your after tax um, salary is now you know instead of being eight thousand two hundred, it's now eight thousand eight hundred. That extra six hundred dollars per month you're getting, if you can, like, yeah. or you want to, obviously, I'm all for balance in life. But maybe you know you go, okay, well, of that extra six hundred dollars a month we're getting, you know, three or four hundred of that we're going to increase the mortgage repayments by. Yeah, it, and, and simple th- other other simple things like tax refunds. Mm. Um, you know, if you can put it in the mortgage, as Kenneth says, into the redraw um, straight away, you might forget about it and um, not not really go without either. So um, all worth doing. Calculators on our website can um, extrapolate those extra monthly repayments and show you how much interest that will save you yeah. over the term and how fast you'll pay it off yeah. for good. Yeah, and it's worth it. Like paying a home loan off five years earlier is so worth it. Imagine what you can do with five years of no mortgage repayments. You know, that $5,000 a month that you don't have to pay anymore can go towards investing. It can go towards superannuation, making sure you've got more financial security, maybe more holidays, better lifestyle. Like you have so many more choices when you don't have a mortgage. That's right. And it is it is realistically possible to pay off your home loan. And look, I think the final bit of advice that you and I both stand strong on together is don't restart the loan term. If you're going to look at refinancing, make the product work for you. You know, if you're 12 years into your home loan, don't restart the 30-year term. Make your loan term 18 years or even better, you know, less if you can afford to. I promise you it's this is a really valuable advice that will make a huge difference further down the track. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And it, 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 as, as we said earlier, it's about looking at what you're currently paying, not going backwards from there, reducing the loan term, increasing payments higher if we can because... The big carrot here, Kenner, is that a lot of lenders are offering cashbacks at the moment to move to them. I have seen that. Well, like, yeah. What is that all about? It's a fight for business. It's a competitive market. It's a fight for business. Mm. Um, and they win because consumers are tricked. And it's just, you know, it, it might be 2000 cashback, but it, it might cost you the best part of 1500 or 2000 to move to them Wow. Um, from your previous lender. So don't always go chasing that cashback and the lower rate. Mm. Talk to your broker. Look at other options. Um and if you do decide to go down that path, that's mm. okay as well. Just be mindful of it and keep your loan term coming down instead of staying the same or mm. going back up. Yeah, okay. All right. Look, everyone, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today on Sugar Mama's Fire Play. I am going to link Adam's details in the podcast description so that you can reach out to him. Please be aware that I receive absolutely no referral fees or commission for this. I'm just happy for people to listen to Adam's very wise, very sensible and trustworthy advice. I know how much he has helped me and Tom. I know how much he's helped me when I was a single mother going through my divorce and and refinancing then. Um, I feel like you've been through (laughs) through a lot, actually. It's been a good ride. It's been been at least, it's got to be 15 years or potentially even a bit longer that we've known each other. And as I said, there's only two people I trust. The the other person I trust is actually retired. So (laughs) they're kind of out of the picture. So really it's down to you. So, you know, feel free to reach out to Adam. Um, Know that there's, there's nothing behind this. This is not sponsored. There's no referral fees. There's no commission. Absolutely nothing. Adam, I'm just happy to share Adam's advice because there it is a market, I think, sometimes where there's maybe some scrupulous, that's the word, I don't know, maybe just invented that, but, um, characters in there, and Adam's one of the few people I trust. We're going to wrap things up because I can hear the kids downstairs banging on the door and about to come running up and um, disturb the peace and quiet. So, Adam, thank you so much for coming over here and recording this podcast with me. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Kenneth. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> And for all the listeners, if you could just take a split second and leave a rating and review, um, of course, feel free to share this podcast as well. I would greatly appreciate it. All right, everyone, have a fantastic week and ciao for now. Always active for a woman, embrace again.
kept me safe and free from harm These days, everything's changed Pull me through my darkest days A constant phase where everything's a game Always stuck in the 